Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. There have been 48 players listed at quarterback to throw a pass for the Atlanta Falcons, and 38 players who have started a game under center for the team. And when you've been around for more than half a century like the Falcons have, you're going to have some good ones in there, along with some really bad ones. On the good side, you have the likes of Matt Ryan, Michael Vick, and Steve Barkowski. And on the bad side, you have guys like Randy Johnson, Joey Harrington, and one of the worst starting quarterbacks of all time, Kim McQuilkin. But even though the Falcons have had their fair share of quarterbacks on both ends of the spectrum, they might not have had a situation as weird as this one. The year before, the quarterback in question was completely out of football and was running for office. His playing days were long over. One year later, not only was he the starting quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons under some extremely bizarre circumstances, but he played relatively well and won a few games in the process. This is the story behind Scott Hunter and what might just be the strangest quarterback situation in Falcons history. Before I talk about the situation at hand and the player in question, we need some context to understand who Scott Hunter is, and how he even came back into the NFL into the Falcons in the first place. Our story begins in 1971 when the Green Bay Packers drafted the Alabama quarterback in the sixth round of the NFL Draft. The man who was primarily responsible for drafting Hunter was the team's director of player personnel, Pat Pepler. He's going to play a major part in our story later on, so keep that thought and that bit of foreshadowing in the back of your head for a bit. The Packers needed a backup quarterback on the younger side after Don Horn left in the offseason to join the Denver Broncos, and since their other two quarterbacks were on their last legs, with Bart Starr being 37 years old and Zeke Brakowski being 40. The Packers were hoping that they could possibly find a gem in the 6th round and find Starr's successor, especially since Pepler loved Hunter. That did not happen. Now, to be fair to Hunter, he was the starting quarterback in 1972 when the Packers won the NFC Central and made it to the postseason, as he guided the team to an impressive 10-4 record. However, he was terrible otherwise, and as we'll find out with that 1972 season, the Packers did well that year in spite of him. Saying that Hunter guided the Packers to the playoffs is like saying Trent Dilfer guided the Baltimore Ravens in 2000 to the Super Bowl. Technically correct, but incredibly misleading. As a rookie in 1971, Hunter was thrown into the fire right away, and was not very good at all. He threw 7 touchdowns and 17 interceptions, finishing the season with a 46.1 passer rating. Out of 30 qualified quarterbacks in the league that season, Hunter was 27th in that category. When 1972 rolled around, it was somewhat of a minor miracle with Hunter under center that the Packers were a playoff team. God bless their defense and the unbelievable one-two punch at halfback in John Brockington and MacArthur Lane, who I made a video about a while ago. You can learn more about him and how he became a Packer by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Hunter started all 14 games and threw just six touchdown passes. Over the final six games of the season, the Packers went 5-1, but Hunter threw no touchdowns and four picks while completing just 43% of his passes for 205 yards, an average of 34 yards per game, and posting a passer rating in that stretch of 23.7 which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. One of those starts was so bad that he finished the game with negative 5 passing yards. Hunter lost his job in 1973, started just 5 games that season, wound up on the Buffalo Bills in 1974 without taking a snap, and was out of the league in 1975. By this point, his football career was done, and there was no real chance of it coming back. Or so he thought. It seemed as though Hunter was not even thinking about football in 1975. He was not on a roster, nor did he have a realistic shot at being on a roster. Why do I bring this up? Because alongside running an appliance store, he spent the 1975 season running for public office, which is a pretty long-term commitment and not just a side job you do to possibly fulfill your dreams of getting back to the NFL. Hunter announced his retirement from the sport to pursue a spot on the Mobile County Commission. In retrospect, Hunter said that this was a crazy notion of his, and even though he lost what seemed to be a tough and competitive race, he said that it was a wonderful experience, where he got to be with people and got to get back on his feet. And when 1976 rolled around, everyone, including Hunter himself, thought it'd be more the same. He would be running his appliance store down in Alabama, would be out and about in the community, and would be away from the game of football. That was until he got a package in the mail. The package was absolutely bizarre, because he didn't order anything. He had no idea that a package was coming. It completely caught him by surprise. However, he opened the mystery package. As for what the package contained of, it was a football. And the man who sent the package, Pat Pepler. Now why there needed to be a package and why Pepler just didn't mail him a letter or fax him over something or call him on the telephone, I have no idea. 
He went through a lot of trouble to just send him a football through the mail. However, when Hunter got the package, he knew what it meant. Hepler wanted Hunter to come join the team in training camp and come play for the Atlanta Falcons. Hepler was still really high on Hunter. When the Packers replaced him in the starting lineup, Hepler wasn't even there anymore, as he was the director of professional scouting for the Miami Dolphins. Now he was the general manager of the Atlanta Falcons, and he was the one calling the shots. Hepler knew his team needed a backup quarterback to Steve Barkowski, especially after Kim McQuilkin, the current backup, threw one touchdown and 18 interceptions over his first two seasons. And just like that, Hunter was training with the Falcons and was on the team. One year after announcing his retirement and running for public office, he was back. All because he got a package in the mail. Unfortunately, it wasn't exactly smooth sailing for the team he was now a member of. The 1976 Falcons were a disaster in just about every sense of the word. We have to exclude the expansion teams when talking about the Falcons, but if you take out the Buccaneers and the Seahawks who were just starting out, there might not have been a worse team in football over the first half of the season than Atlanta. Through the first seven games, they were 1-6. Atlanta had scored 64 points, which was the worst total in the NFC and the second worst total in the NFL, only ahead of the Buccaneers. Remember that the Buccaneers were in the AFC to start things off. Scoring 64 points through seven games comes out to an abysmal average of just over nine points per game. They had a not-so-nice point differential of minus 69. They were shut out twice, with one being at the hands of the New Orleans Saints, a team with a bottom six defense in football, and one being at the hands of the San Francisco 49ers in a game where they finished with five net passing yards. How bad did things get during the season? Tensions were growing between general manager Pat Pepler and head coach Marion Campbell. Pepler was not a fan of Campbell and was begging owner Ranking Smith to fire him. Smith refused. Pepler kept asking, only for Smith to keep refusing. Finally, after a 30-0 loss to the New Orleans Saints to drop to 1-4, heads finally started to roll, and Smith fired Campbell. The catch? He was going to make Pepler the head coach. It would almost felt like a, if you think it's so easy, why don't you do it kind of move. Pepler was adamant about not wanting to be the head coach. He wanted no part of the job whatsoever, yet was forced into the position by the owner. As a side note, if you want to learn more about the 1976 Falcons and the unbelievable dysfunction surrounding the team, which even led to linebacker and Mr. Falcon himself, Tommy Novus, briefly quitting, they click the card in the upper right corner. As incredibly laughable and dysfunctional as this whole incident and this whole season was, with Pepler now on the sidelines as the head coach, he was calling all the shots now. He got to decide who played and who didn't. Steve Barkowski was hurt, so Kim McQuilkin took his place under center. It did not go well. In Week 7 against the 49ers, he got the start and went 7 for 25, completing 28% of his passes, while throwing for 44 yards, no touchdowns, two picks, taking six sacks, and posting a pass rating of 6.2. Remember how I said the Falcons had five net passing yards in that game? With McQuilkin in there, it was minus 23. If you're watching this video right now, congratulations. You had more net passing yards than Kim McQuilkin did on October 23, 1976. And after another awful start against the Saints, where he threw for 24 yards, no touchdowns, one pick, and had an 8.3 passer rating, Pepler decided it was time to play his guy. It was time to play Scott Hunter. The end result? It went surprisingly well. Hunter came off the bench against the Saints, and despite not having received significant action in three years, and despite being retired just a few months before, with no intention whatsoever of coming back, he had the best showing of his career. Off the bench, Hunter went 10 for 11 with 138 yards, two touchdowns, no picks, a completion percentage of 91%, and a passer rating of 158.3. It does not get any higher than that. That is the perfect passer rating. On the heels of those two second half touchdowns, the Falcons erased a 14-0 deficit and came back to win the game 23-20, somehow winning their second game of the season against a team that utterly destroyed them in the first meeting. Two weeks later, he started a home game against the San Francisco 49ers. Remember how the last time those two teams met, Atlanta got shut out and got nothing going through the air? That was not the case on this day. Hunter was only asked to throw 14 times, but he did what he had to do, throwing two touchdowns and no picks, while posting a pass rating of 112.2 and only taking one sack. And with the Falcons trailing 10-7 entering the fourth quarter, those two clutch touchdowns in the second half gave Atlanta the lead and gave the team an eventual 21-16 victory. And the following week, he was the starting quarterback as they stunned the Dallas Cowboys 17-10. It what might have been one of the biggest regular season upsets in the history of the franchise. Hunter even scored the game-winning touchdown in that one. In the four-game stretch from Halloween against the Saints until the Sunday before Thanksgiving against the Cowboys, Scott Hunter, against all odds, was surprisingly good. The Falcons, who had won just one game before, won three out of four, with one of those wins being against the always consistent and reigning NFC champion Dallas Cowboys. 
He was only sacked three times. He threw four touchdown passes and had a passer rating of 77.9. Now, I'm not going to pretend that he lit the world on fire or anything, but if you extrapolate that passer rating over a full season, it's one of the top 10 totals in the league. And back in 1977, an average of one touchdown pass per game would have put him inside the top 10 as well. Scott Hunter did something that was almost unthinkable. This strange situation actually worked out well at first. Unfortunately, his career wouldn't pan out much better from there. After that month-long stretch where Pepler unleashed Hunter and seemingly made him one of the top quarterbacks in football, things fell apart. Over Atlanta's final three games, Hunter regressed back to the form that plagued him for most of his time in Green Bay, as the Falcons went 0-3, with Hunter throwing just one touchdown pass and posting a poor 49.7 passer rating. One of those games was an embarrassing 59-0 loss at the hands of the Los Angeles Rams, in a game where Hunter only threw for 17 yards. Obviously, a healthy Steve Barkowski was going to be the guy going forward, but any possibility of Hunter taking the job from him or starting on another team elsewhere and being dangled as trade bait was completely gone after that poor end to the year. Hunter would start seven games for Atlanta in 1977 out of necessity, but was not very good. In those seven starts, Hunter threw just two touchdown passes and put up a single-digit number of points in four out of seven games. The grit splits defense deserves so much better. It's a crying shame how awful that offense was. Hunter would never start another game after that 1970 season. He would wind up on the Detroit Lions in 1979 as their backup quarterback and would be out of the NFL for good once the 1980s rolled around. Still, it is crazy to think how the second career of Scott Hunter came to be. It really was a strange situation. To be retired and run for public office, only for a mysterious package to arrive at your door and lure you out of retirement, is bizarre in itself. But then, to become the starting quarterback, play at a relatively high level for the era, even if it was only for about a month, and to lead one of the biggest regular season upsets in the history of the franchise? That's almost improbable when you put into that context. How Scott Hunter got to be the starting quarterback of the Falcons might just be one of the strangest quarterback moments in Falcons history. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jrgear9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.